My name is Nicole Robson and I will be performing a short piece for the Haldorophone, a cello-like feedback instrument developed over the past decade by Haldor Ulfasson.
Hi, Kathy. Hi, Leah. Yeah, thanks for inviting me to join you. Yeah, and I'm, I'm excited to sort of share some recent work that I was doing uh, throughout the lockdown in 2020. So could you tell us a little bit about it? Yeah, sure. So um, last year in lockdown, I decided to start really exploring 16 millimeter film practice. And so for quite a few years now, I've been a member of Bristol Experimental Expanded Film, which is an artist run collective in Bristol. And there's quite a lot of skills in the members around this 16 millimeter film practice. And um, lockdown felt like the perfect opportunity to sort of get involved in that. So I wanted to make a piece around the river near my house. And I was thinking about working really hyper locally with just the kind of sounds and materials and environments that were in my immediate vicinity. So I started exploring the River Froome and I wanted to somehow create a 60 millimeter film with the, with the sediment and the kind of particles of the river to try and capture something of that, um, something of the sense of the river, but not sort of directly film it. And I, I kind of called it a collaboration with the river because I was quite interested in this idea that uh, the process of collecting sort of bits of sediment and algae and plant matter from the river. Um, and then I, I basically took it into the dark room, which was actually the back of my van. So there I was in the back of the transit van uh, with these sort of jars of river sediment and um, some 60 millimeter film. And I used the photogram technique where I kind of just placed the material onto the film and this is where I feel like it was kind of like a collaboration because the wetness of the material going directly onto the unexposed film already kind of starts some sort of uh, chemical reactions happening and different uh, sort of material responses between the, the, different, the different kind of stuff. And then exposing that to light and developing it. And um, I learned how to use this kind of eco-processing recipe called caffeinol from filmmaker Vicky Smith, who's also part of Beef. Um, so I was kind of excited about this idea of developing the film without using the kind of photography developer and using coffee, vitamin C and washing soda. It's quite interesting editing the 16 millimeter film because you just end up with this huge mass of actual physical film. And I've only ever done, you know, non-linear linear editing on, you know, computers where you just put your clips in a virtual bin and there they all are. You can get any bit at any time. Whereas with real film, you're sort of faced with you know, just hanging up lots and lots of bits of film in front of light boxes and sort of developing a process. So I'll just, so this is a little bit that I exposed with some dirt from the river, some sediment from the river base. I don't know how easy that is to see. So yeah, where, or where all the, it's kind of like shadows and traces of this sediment. So the clear bits is where the sediment was placed onto the unexposed film. Because this is a negative black and white film. Yeah. I put the sediment on the film again, then I kind of switch on the light for like a couple of seconds and it exposes the bits of film where the sediment isn't covering it. Um, and that goes black. So essentially it's a negative. Yeah. But I kind of, I love the way that the sediment makes the light patches and it's kind of like a light shadow. Um, nice yeah, it's bit. beautiful. And how how is the audio created in this project? Okay, well, this combination of things. Another thing that I'm really fascinated with is on 60 millimeter film, the bit of the film on the edge opposite the sprockets is actually where the soundtrack would usually be printed. And I'm really fascinated by optical soundtracks. Um, I learned earlier last year on a residency to Russia, some very early experiments in sound synthesis where um, this realization that the optical soundtrack of a film could actually be drawn or made, uh, there's always kind of elaborate machines to kind of create these sound wave patterns and synthesize sound directly onto film as very, very early synthesizers in sort of the early 20th century. Um, so I kind of, I kind of really fascinated with that, but basically by, because this is a photogram film and it's not using a camera, I can actually, some of the sediment and plant matter lands on this soundtrack. So wherever some of the sediment lands on the soundtrack, you get a sound from the, from the 60 millimeter projector. So I was really aware that this was gonna make sound as well. And, um, and the other reason I, I was sort of seeing it as a kind of collaboration with the river was that I didn't have full control over how the sediment was gonna land and um, which bits were gonna go on the soundtrack. So there was sort of a really nice element of improvisation and discovery. So when I first played the film, the first time I, I, I heard the sounds and, and uh, you know, 
sort of saw the densities and, and when when they're kind of making it I could get a sense of um you know density so I knew that by sort of uh putting like really globby bits of sediment that it would be obviously quite noisy and quite light and then you know so I'm kind of working a little bit with compositionally but also quite you, you have to be sort of fairly approximate and be and it's also really exciting because there's so many um different things that might happen when you actually eventually see the film and the way that the coffee and the vitamin c the caffeinol develops there's there's room for um unexpected results sometimes which which is always interesting and welcome yeah and just to say another thing about the the sound on the film is is that um I mix between the optical soundtrack of the film and with hydrophone recordings from the same spot in the river. And what's really fascinating is so many of those underwater sounds sometimes can sound a bit electronic or also a bit like the optical soundtrack of the film. So I kind of like this, this uh, sort of unknown, like, is it the optical soundtrack? Is it artificially created synthesized sound or is it actually these unusual sounds from underwater? So it kind of mixes between those two, um, two kind of elements of content in the soundtrack. Um, and one further development in the soundtrack is that I realized um, when I went to try and digitize the film, because I did want to also show it online as you're very, um, I'm very happy that you're sort of going to show some, some of it today. Um, it, you can scan the film, but you don't get the optical soundtrack on the scan. And it's and when I perform live with it with the 60 millimeter projector, I'm changing the speed of the film live to sort of speed it up and slow it down to change the kind of, yeah, just to sort of play live with it whilst mixing in these underwater sounds. And I was at a bit of a point where I was like, how can I document that effectively and digitize it? Um, so I worked with a programmer called Matthew Olden and he built me a max patch that I could run the scanned film through, change the frame rate, and also built um, a system to read the optical soundtrack, but kind of digitally. So it's slightly different to the way the projector reads it. So I've got this, and of course, once it's in a max patch and you can do those kinds of things, I could actually read the optical soundtrack at any point in the film. It didn't have to be on the one side. So I started playing with some more possibilities of working with the light and dark of the film and the speed of the film digitally so I've also kind of played around with that and used the optical soundtrack to also filter it with an EQ so it's become this quite evolving process of sound into visual visual into sound from analog to digital and back again and so it's yeah. I'm curious how this process of working with serendipity and unexpected results and collaboration with an outside source might feed back into your future work for example if you're working more in sculpture or in, in musical instrument design, do you think that now you might open up your process to a bit more of a collaborative design element? Yeah, that's a really good question. I think actually this approach to the film grew from not necessarily the some of the design elements of some um, sculpture instruments I've made. So for instance, um, I know that we met when I was showing Tipping Point um, in London a few years ago, and this piece, even though it's quite precisely designed and the electronics, the way that it works is quite precisely designed, the actual process of playing it, I can't really have absolute full control because it uses audio feedback. And the way that I control the sound is purely based on the flow of water, which is quite slow. So even when I move one of the tubes, I know it's going to change pitch, but I don't know how long that's necessarily going to take. And it's, it's kind of like a collaboration or a sculptural way of working with the piece. And I think that's what I find really appealing about performing live with it, because I have to listen to what's happening at the same time as shifting and changing something. And then all of the kind of acoustic properties of the room come into play as well. So I think I really already enjoy creating instruments or processes where there's gonna be some unknown quantities or I use some kind of generative behavior, like even when tipping points running as an installation, it doesn't have a fixed sequence. It's got a set of uh, parameters that have got probabilities of whether they're going to happen or not so I like to sort of sit in it and wonder what it's going to do and it presents different sequences that I probably wouldn't have thought of so I kind of enjoy enjoy that process in in all, all of the works that I'm kind of playing around with 
So how about we have a look at river traces? Thanks, Cathy, for joining us. Thanks for having me.
Hi Tara, thanks for joining us. Hi Leah. So you were based in Glasgow for a long time and now you're in Brisbane, Australia, which is where you're originally from. I was wondering if you could tell us a little bit about what you've been doing since going back to Australia and how that's working out for you and your phantom chips instruments and making. Um, I've been doing a fair bit since coming back to Australia. It's been actually really good. Uh, I started a space here called Electrolab, which is a space for creative technology and I'm working with an artist who does VR and AR stuff called Michelle Brown. And yeah, together we're putting on workshops. Um, we're currently working on a project for Curiosity, which is an art and science festival that's happening in Brisbane next week from the 12th of March. Next week, the week after. Um, and we're creating an art uh, and light and sound and AR augmented reality installation. So that's something that um, would happen in a gallery and the audience will go in and experience it. It's actually out in public. So it's outside the museum here. And I think there's about 20 other installations all around the city. So it's like a temporary public art project. Um, what else? And I've been doing, yeah, a bit of augmented reality things and creating some instruments. I've been experimenting with the Teensy and microcontrollers a bit more rather than straight electronics, which is what I was doing more of in the UK. Yeah, you were more circuit bending, right? Oh, I was building things. So building a sort of logic based synthesizers, but creating tactile interfaces for them. And now how is working with Teensy going? Oh, it's pretty good. I really like the audio engine that's built into Teensy. So I've kind of adapted the electronic instruments I was using to work with Teensy. So I get a bit more range in the sound, um, although I keep tending to go back to the logic uh you get logic noise stuff in the teensy as well and what have you been creating well i've got the tentacle belts here i can give you a demo if you want yes, um, please. the one i'm about to play is i think it's a couple of sine waves and mm. with handmade pressure sensors just put it on properly And yeah, it's quite a simple TNC project. Okay, I'll just get back. Okay, so. And this one here is, I think it's a square wave and a triangle wave, and they're being mixed with an XOR mixer. So that's that's the logic gate mixer. And this one's a lot noisier. One sec. Those are called tentacles. Yeah, I guess I call them tentacles, uh, noise tentacles. And I've been working with this kind of tentacle shape around your crotch area for a while because I like it because it's pretty ridiculous. Um, when I was playing in public more, I'd give them out to the audience to play as well. So it's kind of me playing them first as a way of disarming people because I get up there and look pretty silly. And I think people want to have a go, but also I've just done something really silly, so they kind of don't mind looking silly themselves or, I mean, I don't know if you look silly, but I think they, it disarms people. They're really cool. How does the pressure sensor work? So the pressure sensor is made um, 
from two layers of conductive fabric with a carbon layer in between. So the carbon layer is resistive, it's pressure sensitive. So as you yeah, press harder, I think the resistance goes lower. And then I'm using the Arduino code sort of to map that to a range, a frequency range. They seem really fun to play. They are really fun to play. And I guess as they've gotten a little bit older, they've gotten floppier and you can sort of wobble them around. And it's, it's, it's nice because you can get a different way of playing electronic sounds that you can't necessarily get from a keyboard or other interfaces. Have you been doing much collaboration with instrument design over there? Because I know your work with Natalie Sharple and Taxidermist. You helped co-design the playable spine that she's been using in the Body Vice shows. Yeah, um, over here, not so much. I've been talking to some modular synth makers here to turn the Noisy Bastard, which is sort of a hardware instrument I've designed into a modular. Um, but as such, I've been yeah, not collaborating on hardware so much. I was wondering how the collaboration with Natalie Sharp actually came about. So I think Natalie had seen me play and she had the idea to start Body Vice and she got in touch with me about making skin instruments, that was her original word for it. And she'd been doing a lot of research and uh, yeah, wanted to make sort of tactile things that were representative of the body. And she yeah, bought these spines and we created a whole heap of touch points on them to play samples from an SD card. Yeah, so it sort of evolved over time. It started off uh, with different, like a couple of proximity sensors on some clothing. I think the first gig we didn't have the spine. We had these sort of slit scan outfits Natalie had made. And I had some stretch sensors that I'd knitted that I put in some of the costumes and some proximity sensors using the bare conductive boards. So capacitive touch with proximity sensing. Uh, that was the first one and then yeah we moved into having the spine and I was like oh we can add touch points on all these like little nerve ending parts um, and that was pretty nice we wired it up as well so that the wires sort of represent nerves or blood vessels yeah it was really impactful watching it live yeah and then all those sounds so Natalie had been in an MRI and um, I've had an MRI I don't know if you've ever had one but it sounds pretty amazing like it, uh, you can, I just really like the sound. So we did a lot of things to sort of replicate the sounds of an MRI and put those samples into the spine. Lots of repeating stutters and bangs. Yeah, I actually had an MRI recently and I got in there and suddenly I started thinking about Body Vice, like the sound reminded <laughs> me of the Body Vice show. So I was just thinking about Body Vice the whole time. Yeah, and I don't know if you remember the body vice visuals as well, but we had the sort of this circular motif we keep using, which was sort of like when you go in the MRI and your view outwards is that circle. It sounds like you're doing so many exciting things over there. Thanks for showing us this as part of the Augmented Instruments Lab Conference. Well, thanks for having me. Bye.